work we're doing is incredibly um, congruent with what Bill and the center are trying to do. The central message I'm bringing to you today from the U.S. Department of Education can be summarized in two very simple words, which are thank you. Everyone who works in education is a hero. The fact is, people who work in education subsidize their schools every day with the countless hours they work outside of contract, um, have given up careers that pay, frankly, a lot more money, and frankly, sometimes don't get as respected and supported as they should in our communities. So when I start by saying thank you, I mean that very sincerely. All of us who've been appointed by the president are folks who came to this from the field. My boss, the secretary, is a former superintendent, spent his entire life in education. Um, not a politician, neither am I. We have, until about a year ago, all of us were on your side of this microphone. So we know how hard the work you're doing is and how it should be rewarded and supported a great deal more than it is in a lot of corners of our society. So I just want to start basically by saying thank you. Now, where does the Office of Safe and Drug-Free Schools, the smallest but mightiest office of the U.S. Department of Education, uh, fit into all this? Well, as I often tell the Secretary, I run the most important office in the U.S. Department of Education for a very simple reason. Students can't learn if they don't feel safe. Period. End of story. All these other things I've just talked about, improving assessments, increasing achievement, higher graduation rates, none of them happen if my office fails. So it's the foundation. When you ask kids themselves, something we so rarely do in schools, what they think, they will tell you that incivil behavior, bullying, name calling, social exclusion, is about twice as likely to cause school avoidance behavior, skipping school, skipping a class, avoiding an area, avoiding an activity, than the horrific incidents like Columbine or Virginia Tech that make the evening news. The fact is, those incidents are obviously horrific, but they're not what most kids spend their days worrying about. Most kids spend their days worrying about stuff that's much kind of lower level. If a young, one is, a young woman is sitting in Mr. Jennings' U.S. history class and she is distracted by the text messages she's getting from the boy at the back of the room, or she's worried about what's going to be written on her locker when she goes to get her books between classes, or what it's going to be like when she gets on the bus to go home at the end of school, she is not thinking about U.S. history. This is, first and foremost, an academic issue. It distracts kids from learning. That's why we have to tackle it. I think there's no coincidence that just as America has kind of fallen back to the middle of the pack among developed countries in terms of our graduation rates, we are about in the middle of the pack in terms of the rates of bullying we have at our schools. And by the most conservative estimation out there, which is the uh, indicators of school crime and safety, a joint study we do with the Department of Justice, about a third of kids say that they experience bullying at their schools from students to state legislators to Washington bureaucrats like me can make a difference. The fact is, when a kid intervenes when they see one of their peers being bullied, 57% of the time the bullying stops in less than 10 seconds. Problem is, in less than one in five incidents, do kids intervene? Now, I'm not blaming the kids for not intervening, but the fact is, the idea that this is something that we are powerless against, which often we feel, and frankly sometimes we're told, is simply untrue. Everybody from the kids to the adults to the policymakers can make a difference. So you probably wonder at this point, what are the actions to take? Well, I'm absolutely thrilled that policymakers are starting to do the right thing in some places. New York just passed an anti-bullying law. New Hampshire's passed an anti-bullying law. The fact is, though, policies, which are critical, but they're basically <coughs> The end of the beginning of what you need to do, not the beginning of the end. The policy, unless it is implemented effectively, is worth the paper it is written on. And that's why the work you're doing over the next few days is so important. It's all about how do we take this abstract rule and how do we make it work. And I believe it's by addressing the other two P's. First of all, programs. I don't know about you, but in my master's program at Teachers College, I received no training on these issues whatsoever. <coughs> So we've got to provide training and programming for the staff so they know what to do. The third thing we have to do is look at practices, which is essentially teaching kids better and healthier ways of treating each other. So if you really want to create change in a school, you can't just stop with the policy. You have to have the programs and the practices as well. That's what creates lasting change that actually sticks in a school. And you have to engage all of the stakeholders. 
the kids, their families, the staff. When I say, notice I'm saying staff, not teachers. Because school resource officers, bus drivers, lunch ladies, everybody in the school is important. But to be a safe school is not just one in which nothing bad is happening to you. It should be something good is happening as well. And what does that look like? It's a school where every kid feels like they belong, every kid feels valued, every kid feels like they matter. Because that is the foundation of educational achievement. 